Before we begin, I'd like to say a quick word on Opera Browser, the faster, safer and smarter browser. Opera Browser is fully specced for privacy, security and everything you do online. Experience faster, distraction-free browsing with built-in ad blocking and browse privately with the built-in VPN. Smoothly sync your data and send files between Opera on Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS and Chromebook. I especially like the Tab Islands feature, where I can organise tabs into content-based grouping, quickly expanding and collapsing what I'm currently focusing on. I can also switch between entire preset workspaces, for switching between work and pretending to work with ease. Use Aria, an AI-driven assistant who will answer your questions and instructions with web-connected real-time information. You can also link the built-in music player to seven major music streaming services such as Spotify or Apple Music, and connect major messaging services like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp and more. Use our link in the description below to make your digital life easier by switching to Opera Desktop Browser free today. At 1am on the 23rd of March 2003, the 507th Army Maintenance Company is trying to make up time, having been delayed since the start of Operation Iraqi Freedom. They are driving in darkness on Iraq's Highway 8 when they approach an intersection. The commanding officer, Captain Troy King, makes a mistake and continues on the highway rather than turning off as ordered. They approach the sprawling city of Nasiriyah and its more than 400,000 inhabitants. The 18-vehicle convoy draws closer to the city and runs into an Iraqi roadblock manned by men with AK-47s. Rather than opening fire, the Iraqis wave the Americans in and King leads the column into Nasiriyah at 6am. It is here that the 507th and the entire coalition will receive a nasty shock from an enemy they have underestimated. There are at least 4,000 Iraqi fighters waiting for them in the city. It is now the third day of the invasion. Despite an improvised start to the campaign, coalition forces are methodically advancing north, with the American 5th Corps on the left and the Marine Expeditionary Force on the right. Most of the initial objectives have been achieved on schedule. The Marines have secured the Ramila oil fields, the British are steadily encircling Basra, and 5th Corps is preparing to drive on Baghdad itself. The day before, the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division reached the outskirts of the town of As Samawa, having advanced 130 miles in just two days. Leading elements of 5th Corps have also advanced to the suburbs of Nasiriyah. Although the army units are meant to bypass the city, the 507th AMC is mistakenly and unknowingly driving right through it. The convoy moves slowly through the narrow streets past Iraqis who seem surprised to see the American trucks. Things are tense until the convoy reaches the other side of Nasiriyah without taking any fire. However, Captain King now realises he has made a mistake and orders the 507th AMC back into the city to rejoin the assigned route. As the convoy turns around and retraces its steps, King orders lock and load as the column passes Saddam Fedayeen fighters, who are eyeing the Americans with anticipation. At 7am, the vehicles make a left turn onto Highway 16 and begin taking small arms fire from every direction. They attempt to fire back, but many of their small arms have become jammed by the desert sand. The convoy misses the turn back into the city, forcing Captain King to search for an area ahead where they can make a U-turn. In the confusion, the convoy splits into three groups as it tries to fight its way out of the city, with the faster Humvees outrunning the slower maintenance trucks, as the drivers desperately try to avoid improvised roadblocks. Two Americans are killed while the convoy is trapped in the killing zone, and multiple trucks must be abandoned when they are too badly damaged. The Saddam Fedayeen is a heavily armed paramilitary composed of the Ba'ath Party's most loyal members and formed after Saddam's defeat in 1991 to brutally suppress the rebellions against his rule. The Shiite population in southern Iraq is generally supportive of the invasion, but the Fedayeen keep order through brutalising the locals, often executing civilians who try to surrender themselves to coalition forces. Finally, the convoy has found an area large enough to execute a U-turn. In the middle of the convoy, 
Private Brandon Sloan's truck breaks down in the middle of the chaos. He and his passenger, Sergeant Donald Walters, disembark while the five-ton wrecker behind them moves in for a combat pickup. Sloan is able to climb aboard the wrecker, but Walters is accidentally left behind. Alone in a hostile city, Walters fights his way to the Saddam Canal by himself. It is believed that Walters was looking to lay low before attempting to escape the area. However, he is soon cornered by Fedayeen fighters, and Walters continues to resist with nowhere else to run. Heavily outnumbered, he fires every single one of his 201 rounds from his M16. Despite running out of ammunition, Walters refuses to surrender and must be forcibly taken into custody by his captors. He is then summarily executed by the Fedayeen militia. Sergeant Donald Walters will later be awarded the Silver Star. Meanwhile, the rest of the convoy has re-entered the heart of the city and is speeding towards the Euphrates River Bridge. At 7.30am, the first group led by Captain King finally emerges from Nasiriya and runs into Marines from Alpha Company of the 8th Tank Battalion. Their commander, Major Bill Peoples, learns of the ambush and orders his tanks forward to help the embattled members of the 507th AMC. Covered by two Marine Corps AH-1 Cobras and a pair of F-A-18s, eight tanks along with a Marine Rifle Platoon launch a bounding advance. As they fight their way in, Alpha Company is confronted by an Iraqi tank, along with AA and artillery positions. The Marines swiftly destroy all of them. They arrive to find ten survivors of Group 2 pinned down by Iraqi fire. Under supporting fire from the tanks and air supports, Alpha Company managed to save these survivors and get them to safety. However, 10 Americans are killed and 6 more captured in the ambush of the 507th Army Maintenance Company. At 7.10am, an Army tractor trailer in the 3rd group swerves to avoid a dump truck but jackknifes and crashes. The Humvee behind attempts to go around only to be hit by an RPG in the front tyre, causing the Humvee to smash into the back of the truck at high speed. Everyone in the Humvee is killed except for the two female privates, Laurie Piestewa and Jessica Lynch, who were wounded and captured by the Iraqis. Private Piestewa will later die in captivity, becoming the first female Native American soldier killed in service of the United States. In total, 15 of the 18 vehicles in the 507th AMC are destroyed in the deadly ambush. The 8th Tank Battalion is part of Task Force Tarawa, the designation for the 2nd Marine Brigade, which is to capture two bridges in the eastern sector of Nasiriya. This will allow Jim Mattis's 1st Marine Division a direct route into Mesopotamia. Task Force Tarawa is to seize the crossings over the Euphrates and the Saddam Canal as soon as possible in order to keep up with the fast pace demanded by Mattis. The Marines are not expecting much resistance at the bridges. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Grabowski's 1st Battalion of the 2nd Marine Regiment will be the spearhead for this operation. Before the assault, Task Force Tarawa's commanding officer, Brigadier General Rich Natonsky, takes Grabowski aside and asks him to rescue the missing members of the 507th AMC if possible. Ricky, you have got to see if you can find those guys, they'd do it for us. Grabowski's plan is for Alpha Company to take the lead and seize the Euphrates Bridge by late morning. Then, Bravo and Charlie companies will swing east and north of the city through an open field to capture the bridge over the Saddam Canal. Alpha Company advances towards the Euphrates Bridge but soon spots nine T-55 tanks defending a railway overpass. Grabowski sends an anti-tank team ahead of his column to destroy the Iraqi tanks. The T-55s have been purposefully immobilised to be used as pillboxes making them easy targets for the AT team, which dismounts from their Humvees and flanks around the Iraqi tanks. Using their FGM-148 Javelins, the AT team makes quick work of the obsolete Iraqi tanks, which first entered service in 1958. All nine T-55s are destroyed, and the attack continues. Alpha Company seizes the Euphrates Bridge without much trouble and secures the perimeter allowing Bravo and Charlie to advance towards the Saddam Canal Bridge. However, 
Bravo Company finds that the open field they are supposed to move through to circumvent the town is actually a marshy sewage plain, and the vehicles quickly bog down. A tank retriever is called for, which also becomes stuck. With the column mired in the sewage, and coming under increasingly heavy Iraqi fire from rooftops to their east and west, Grabowski orders the men to dismount and head to the second bridge on foot. The Iraqis are using shoot and scoot tactics, popping up on the flat rooftops to take shots at the marines before moving to their next location. Cobra attack helicopters are ordered in to provide gunship overwatch, suppressing Iraqi fire long enough for Bravo Company to keep moving. At the same time, Charlie Company moves across the Euphrates Bridge but does not spot Bravo Company. Due to a breakdown in communications, Captain Dan Whitnam believes that Bravo actually took the direct route through Nasiriyah's main street and decides to follow. His column speeds towards the second bridge through the heart of the city, a route that will soon become known as Ambush Alley. Meanwhile, in Umm Qasar, the US Marines from the 15th MEU are relieved by the Royal Marines of 3 Commando, and the port of Umm Qasar is declared open by American Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. However, the reality on the ground is far different. The Saddam Fedayeen have fortified themselves in the old town of Umm Qasar and put up unexpectedly strong resistance. It will take several more days and multiple casualties among the Royal Marines before the city is finally secured. After the fall of Umm Qasar, British Defence Secretary Jeff Hoon publicly compares the ports to Southampton. One Royal Marine cracks, it's not at all like Southampton, there's no beer and they're shooting at us, it's more like Portsmouth. In Nasiriyah, Captain Whitnam's Charlie Company is speeding through the streets at 45 miles per hour, racing towards the Saddam Canal Bridge. The Iraqis are initially slow to react, surprised by the fast-moving column of vehicles, Ambush Ali had been identified as a potential Iraqi kill zone before the invasion and no provisions have been made to clear the dangerous four-lane boulevard. The Iraqis quickly overcome their initial shock and fire RPGs and machine guns into the convoy. Yet, unlike the outgunned 507th AMC, the Marines of Charlie Company are able to bring Mark 19 grenade launchers and 50 caliber machine guns to bear on the enemy. Furthermore, the Marines' vehicles stay together without bunching up, allowing them to keep a coherent formation. Just as the convoy is crossing the canal bridge, the last assault amphibious vehicle in line is hit by an RPG in the back ramp, seriously wounding four Marines. The commander of the vehicle, First Lieutenant Michael Seeley, is a veteran of the First Gulf War, where he receives the Bronze Star. As the AAV begins to slow down due to a damaged track, Seeley orders the driver to get across the bridge before they break down. Push, 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 we have to get the hell out of here. The AAV manages to limp to the other side of the canal where the rest of Charlie Company is in a massive firefight, having been caught in a successfully pre-planned ambush by Fedayeen and Iraqi army forces. Faced with a hail of small arms and mortar fire, Whitnam deploys his lead vehicles in herringbone formation, and the marines dismount to form a defensive perimeter at a T-intersection. Whitnam requests fire support from an army artillery battalion, while Cobra gunships rake the Iraqi positions with rocket and gunfire. However, Charlie Company does not have a forward air controller, so any airstrike will be going in blind and at major risk of friendly fire. The Iraqi mortars find their range, and a quick barrage devastates the marine position, killing three and wounding three more. An NCO asks Whitnam if the casualties can be sent back across the bridge, to which the captain replies, Absolutely not, we need to hold right where we're at. However, a breakdown in communication leads to four AAVs leaving the position to retreat back through Ambush Alley. Whitnam can only watch helplessly as his radio net is jammed with marines talking over each other in the chaos. Charlie Company and Whitnam are in the fight of their lives at the intersection and have just lost half of their vehicle strength thanks to the miscommunication. The retreating AAVs carrying dead and wounded marines again comes under heavy RPG and machine gun fire as they run the gauntlet down Ambush Alley. 
Only the Mark 19 and 50 calibre machine guns are able to keep the fully alerted enemy at bay. To make matters worse, two A-10 warthogs orbiting the city spot the AAVs moving south and assume it is an Iraqi armoured counterattack, and therefore anything north of them will be Iraqi. The second AAV in the line takes a direct hit from an Iraqi RPG. Loaded with mortar ammunition, the AAV explodes in a massive fireball, killing eight marines. The third is struck by an RPG in the treads, forcing the squad inside to abandon the vehicle and set up a defensive position at a nearby building to await rescue. The final AAV takes a hit to the ramp from another RPG, blowing the back off but the vehicle continues to the bridge. Just as it is about to reach safety, another RPG explodes inside the AAV, setting it on fire and wounding nine marines inside. The first AAV in the line makes it back to Alpha Company, who immediately begin medevac procedures. By early afternoon, Charlie Company's position is dangerously exposed, but no one in the Battalion HQ, co-located with Bravo Company, knows where Charlie Company is. The regimental air officer calls in the two A-10 warthogs on station to support the battalion, but Whitnam's Charlie Company becomes the victim of another dangerous miscommunication. The air controller has mistakenly been told that any units north of Bravo Company are hostile. The warthogs roll in to launch airstrikes against what they don't realise are Charlie Company's vehicles. The A-10s make multiple passes, strafing and bombing the remaining AAVs with AGM-65 Maverick missiles and firing their 30mm guns. The vehicles are marked with friendly markings, but the Warthogs have not been equipped with the new thermal identification system. Finally, Whitnam makes contact with Grabowski and calls off the airstrike. Six Marines have been killed. Meanwhile, Major Bill Peoples has heard on the radio that Charlie Company is taking a pounding and has decided to act. Without orders, Major Peoples has taken two Abrams main battle tanks and has told his executive officer, Hey, XO, punch it, we're going to run down this damn alley as fast as we can and hope we don't get hit. His own Abrams had broken down when the attack began, but he has acquired a new vehicle. The tanks advance through Ambush Alley firing on both sides of the street with their machine guns. Although the well-armoured Abrams can endure a lot of punishment, it only takes one well-placed RPG or recoilless rifle round to disable the tank. Peoples breaks through to Whitnam's position and his tanks provide overwhelming fire. Alpha Company is ordered to push forward across the Saddam Canal to support the beleaguered marines on the north bank. As they are en route, and now with Abrams tank support raining shells on the Iraqi assault, the attacks begin to subside. Charlie Company will soon be relieved, and enemy fire has slackened significantly. The situation is coming back under control. Peoples will go back into Nasiriyah again to rescue the Marines still trapped in the building in Ambush Alley. 28 Americans are killed in Nasiriyah on the 23rd of March alone and none of the missing members of the 507th AMC are found by the Marines. Thanks again to our patrons who make these videos possible. Your support is the reason we can produce series like this. Welcome to all our new patrons this month, and a special thanks to our patron of the week, Erica Lake. Each week we select our favourite Patreon reactions to shout out. This week from Chung, who says, That's a huge consequence for making a wrong turn. And Rock Crusher 26 who says, Absolutely insane how one mere wrong turn started an intense fight for a city, along with miscommunication and underestimating their opponents that caused more bloodshed than was needed. If you'd like to join our Patreon and get access to exclusive benefits such as early access to videos ad and sponsor free, we would love to have you as part of our community.